Hi, I'm Kristen Lammert. I'm an engineer at HashiCorp and I work on Terraform Core, specifically the open source CLI component. You might remember me from such previous HashiConf talks as, what is a Terraform even? Why isn't Terraform 1.0 out yet? And what is a Terraform even part two? I'm still not sure. Okay, no, these are not actual talk titles, but they are things I say fairly frequently at work. Now, while there's more to me than just my cats, my past few talks have shown me that the cats are all that you're likely to remember and even care about. So yes, I am too into my cats. I was raised by cats. Please enjoy pictures of my cats. I am absolutely delighted to be here today in celebration of this important milestone. Terraform 1.0 is released. It's been a long and winding path, but we have arrived at our destination and I'm proud to be here today. I'd also like to introduce the rest of my immediate team. I get to work with James, Martin, Alistair, and Pam. Now Pam has since moved on to another company, but we all work together on Terraform 1.0. And when it's time to celebrate our work, we enjoy doing so while admiring farm animals over Zoom. I cannot overstate how delightful it is to watch a Zoom full of adults just grinning unabashedly at farm animals. If you aren't already, I highly recommend finding something you can do to celebrate your own accomplishments. Last year, I gave a talk called The Path to Terraform 1.0, and I spent a lot of time talking about HashiCorp's very high standards for a 1.0 release. One thing HashiCorp is well known for, dare I say notorious, is that our widely used, production-ready, and critical path tools stay at zero dot something releases for years. During that last talk, I said that Terraform was pretty close to meeting these criteria. Definitely deployed broadly, we understand the use cases and the UX, but we still had a lot of work to do kind of specifically on that last bullet point, the stable and mature architecture. Well, we did the work. Like, kind of a lot of work, so much that we needed to break up our giant change logs into one per release. And each of those releases had a long list of changes. This last one is just the bug fixes in a single release. But before I spend too much time bragging about all the hard work me and my team did, there's something else I want to talk about, another detour on the road to 1.0. It has been a heck of a year and some, year and a half for everyone. Um, and while there's nothing new about humans living through difficult situations, that's just life. Um, there are always natural disasters, uh, political unrest, public health crises, heartbreaking injustices. I still think most people are going to agree that 2020 was especially anxiety inducing. I'm bringing this up because I think it's very important that we say aloud. I am not up here bragging about Terraform 1.0 because my team doubled down and focused on our productivity and gave 120% every day. Although if that was your coping strategy, that is fine and valid. But I am up here because my team members are kind and patient and empathetic. Uh, we give each other space to feel what we're feeling. We support each other by listening, uh, just being there for each other, doing what we can to lift each other up. A coworker sent me this e image here. You can even on a particularly rough day and as silly as you know these memes are, it is exactly what I needed to hear. So please don't let anyone tell you that empathy and kindness aren't among the most important skills for you to cultivate and to look for in others. Okay, yes, the point. We are here to talk about what is new in Terraform 1.0. I got a really good feeling about this next slide. You're going to love this. So what is new in Terraform 1.0 is absolutely nothing. Please contain your shock. Okay, at this point, you're probably wanting to know either why there aren't any new features in Terraform 1.0 or why they let me speak at the conference when I clearly have nothing to say. Well, let's recap on that previous slide. This last criteria, which is where I said Terraform needed the most work, is a stable and mature architecture. We do a lot of experimentation in core. And so when we release new features, we depend heavily on user feedback to find out how you're actually using those features and what changes we might need to make. 
new features frequently change after the initial release, and sometimes in ways that aren't backwards compatible. So to ensure that we don't do that, we don't have to make any breaking changes to features in 1.0, we didn't put anything new in 1.0. Now don't worry, you're gonna see new features starting in 1.1, and I will talk about that in a little bit. But our primary focus for 1.0 was stability. So really, Terraform 0.15 was 1.0 beta, and 0.15.6-ish is 1.0. 1.0 is really a promise. We couldn't release 1.0 until we could make these promises. So barring any critical bugs or security issues, we will not make breaking changes to the configuration language and workflows. You won't be required to run an update tool to go from 1.anything to 1.anything else. Although we may still write an update command, uh, upgrade command just for any new features we add to help you adopt them. We also promise that the plugin protocols and a bunch of our public interfaces are stable for all of the 1.0 series, 1.x. To make those promises, we needed to complete a bunch of big projects. Refactoring, bug fixes, removing deprecated components, and stabilizing the protocol and features so that we can promise that long-term support. I'm going to dig deeper into a couple of these topics on the next slides. We did a lot of refactoring, and most of this is work that's going to be completely invisible to practitioners. We removed a lot of unused code, and so I'd like to give a shout out to Alex, another HashiCorp engineer who kind of kicked off that work for us with this early PR, just removing some 3,000 lines of code. I got to do a very large and very satisfying refactor of Terraform's internals. Um, I'd honestly love to give a talk on just this project. Um, but again, it's really only interesting to other core developers. We started refactoring the CLI command package, so we've split out the argument processing and UI rendering into their own packages. Uh, this is another thing that I have wanted to see done for the three years I've worked on Tor Terraform, and I really love the work my team did on this. And oh my, did we write a lot of tests. We'd spent a lot of time fixing and sending our test suite. Another key task we needed to complete before releasing Terraform 1.0 is removing deprecated features. So we're stuck with anything we didn't remove in time for 1.0 until 2.0. So it was really important we get this right. We removed the unmaintained built-in vendor provisioners. Uh, now don't worry, local exec, remote exec, and the file provisioners are here to stay. And you can still use third-party provisioners uh, as external plugins for all of 1.0. CLI commands now have a chadir flag, which is replacing that very inconsistently implemented directory argument. And then some language features, like the list and map functions or the older ignore changes syntax, have been replaced and updated with more modern functions and syntax. So I hope you notice something on this slide. We're not removing things just for the sake of removing things. We're only removing features that have already been communicated as deprecated, first of all, so no surprises. Um, and we focused on features where we have either a direct replacement or a more general, better way of doing things. So we've tried our hardest to do this thoughtfully to make the Terraform experience better for 1.0 and beyond. And of course, we have been adding new features in the last couple of releases. And these are all critical features that we needed to get into Terraform 1.0, kind of specifically, like I said earlier, to give us time to make any breaking changes once we've got those features into users' hands. So we made a lot of changes to the provider installer, and I'm going to go into that in more detail on the next slide. We improved the mechanism for passing providers into modules by adding an explicit configuration aliases field to the required providers, which is inside the Terraform block. Uh, this should make things easier for both module authors and module consumers, and it's in keeping with Terraform's main principle that explicit is better than implicit. We relax the remote state file compatibility, so it's no longer limited to only a minor release. What I mean by this is that Terraform is no longer going to complain that it can't possibly read a state file from 1.1 or 0.15, so that's been made a lot more consistent. And we've added sensitive input variables and extended the capabilities of provider-defined sensitive attributes. And so this gives both provider developers and Terraform practitioners better control over what values get output in the UI. And this is the next feature I'm going to go a little deeper into. I'm highlighting these features specifically because they are examples of larger projects that we had to roll out gradually over a series of multiple releases. 
Uh, I don't have time for a real deep dive, but my goal is to give you a look at what's available. And that way, if something here sparks your interest, you can go check out our documentation and the Learn website for more information. Now, the provider installer has changed a lot over the last couple of releases. This really started in version 0.13. We've added the concept of provider source. And what this does is enable automatic installation of community providers when you run Terraform init. So previously you could automatically download all of HashiCorp's providers. But last time I checked, there's around 1000 community providers available on the registry. And you can now download all of these automatically when you run Terraform init. We've also added a lot of options for configuring provider installation and a dependency lock file that lets practitioners ensure that Terraform will always use the exact same version of a provider, regardless of what workstation you're running Terraform from. And then there are some new kind of supporting CLI commands to go along with this work. All right, let's get into some examples. An interesting side effect of the provider source work is that it's valid to have two providers with effectively the same name. So in this example configuration, I have two random providers. Um, this configuration's required provider block shows that I'm using both the HashiCorp random provider as well as this custom Calamity Mild Wonky random provider. Now, this is actually a fairly real example. For another project, I had to fork the random provider code, and part of that project was proving that Terraform could still use both versions of random in a single configuration. So this is kind of a neat thing, I think. In this snippet, you can see two random pet resources, and one of them is using HashiCorp random. That's the default behavior. So that top resource that doesn't have any special configuration is going to use the default provider. And then that second resource is using my custom version of random. And you can see that with the provider equals my random. Now I'm going to give a glimpse of the installation options. So this snippet is from your Terraform CLI configuration file. And in this one, I've defined both a file system mirror and a network mirror. In the file system mirror configuration, the include directive tells Terraform that all providers whose source address is the Terraform registry, and that's the default source if you haven't said anything specifically. So all of those providers should be installed from this local file system mirror I've configured. While my custom fork provider is an exception, and that is hosted by this made up network mirror that I've set up. And then on the days I'm wearing my provider developer hat, I use this dev overrides configuration option. And that option tells Terraform to look in the directory, well, in my option, tells Terraform to look in the directory where the provider binary gets compiled. Um, and a neater detail about this that you can't actually see in the file is that when I use dev overrides, I don't need to run Terraform init. So I can just recompile that binary over and over and over again, and Terraform will just pick it up automatically. So if you're someone who has to recompile your binary every five minutes because you don't actually know what you're doing, that is quite a time saver. Okay, now I'm gonna switch gears and talk about the sensitivity enhancements. And these are really our first steps towards an even more secure Terraform experience. Earlier versions of Terraform had the concept of provider-defined sensitive attributes and sensitive outputs. In Terraform version 0.14, we added user-defined sensitive input variables and in the next several releases, we did a lot of work to incorporate those changes throughout Terraform so that any expression that is derived from a sensitive value will also be marked sensitive and redacted in the UI. And then like before, we added some new functions that help us support this work. Now, the examples I have of sensitivity are very basic. So again, I'm just trying to give you a taste of the cool things that are available. Here I have a variable named password, which I have declared as sensitive by adding sensitive equals true. There's also a corresponding sensitive output, which prints the value of this password. Now, it's worth noting that Terraform would emit an error if I used that output without writing sensitive equals true. That's one of Terraform's kind of few, are you really sure you mean to share this value kind of uh, checks. So with this configuration, I can run plan and apply. And in both cases, Terraform redacts that sensitive password from the UI. Now, of course, if what I really need to do is see that sensitive value with my own eyeballs, for whatever reason, I can use this non-sensitive function to override the value sensitivity. And so now when I run Terraform apply, it displays my secret password in the UI. 
So again, incredibly basic example, but what's really interesting is the way that Terraform can now track those expressions derived from the sensitive values. So if I took that password and built it into a longer string or passed it to a template or referred to the output from an entirely different module, Terraform keeps track of that sensitivity and will continue to redact any expression built up from my password. We've got a few big projects in sight for our 1.x releases. Now, please keep in mind, this is not a roadmap. I'm not making promises about what's coming when, but I wanna show you what we've been talking about inside the team. One thing we talk about a lot is everything is a plan, where we're rethinking all of Terraform's operations, not just plan as apply, as operations that can be planned and applied. We're supporting that idea with some research into representing very specific commands, such as import and state moves in configuration directly, either instead of, or as an alternative to the bespoke command line operations. And we're always working on improving Terraform Core's integration with both Terraform Cloud and our enterprise offering, doing some really lovely work, making sure that there is parity so that anything you can do in the CLI, you can do in cloud. And that's directly related to my everything is a plan work um, and improving uh, the UI output and just how things look. Now, I already introduced the Terraform core team, but we are only one small part of the whole Terraform 1.0 effort at HashiCorp. There have been so many teams and individuals that helped us out here. We've had designers, technical writers, product managers, release engineering. They're the people who work on the registry and on our cloud and enterprise tools. These are all friends and coworkers that contributed and helped us get to Terraform 1.0. Uh, so I'm really grateful to all of my fellow Hashi Corporeals. I could not have done this without all of your combined efforts. Thank you.